بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم <تصفيق> الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وعلى كل من تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما سبحانك اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم أرنا الحق حقا ورزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا ورزقنا اجتنابه وبعد Respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. <clears throat> it's an honor and a privilege to be here again at this Islamic center of Oshawa. I was here last year as well, I don't know if some of you remember. Uh, same time, November, when we came for the same stairs to bliss. Sorry, pause the paradise. Sorry, conference. I've been to that conference as well before. This is actually my 16th, I was talking to, my son actually remembers this. This is my 16th visit to Toronto from 2007, 1-6. So every time he counts, he goes, you're going, this is your 16th time to Toronto. He said, take me one time. I said, inshallah, just get a bit older, then you can come with me. So it's, it's an honor and it's a really privilege to come here. Toronto is a very beautiful city, mashallah. Muslims generally here, it's always pleasant to meet the Muslims. People have a lot of zeal, a lot of desire to learn about Islam. Very interested, mashallah. The topics that are chosen at the various programs, at the various masajid, are pertinent and important topics, which deal with day-to-day -day life. And this is what I like, because the topics that we talk about are not just topics which are which are also important, but it's not just dealing with you know, topics like repentance and toba and death. We talk about topics that deal with our day-to-day -day life. So like tomorrow's workshop, as Mawlana Shakir just introduced, it's a very important workshop. I'm not here to advertise the workshop, but if you haven't already registered, and maybe you should, it's an important topic. This is my third time for the Masjid Abu Bakr program that I'm coming on. The first time we had a workshop which was on marriage. Two days course I delivered on marriage and then last year was upbringing of children and then this year we actually are doing a program on the taboo word that people don't like to talk about which is divorce. So the title I gave I said dealing with divorce and the fiqh of divorce and the rules of divorce and separation but then they said to me that people actually don't like this you know people won't come because because i think well i don't want to divorce but that's the reason why you want to come to a program like this because you want to avoid divorce and we have to take the reality because we have divorces in our communities and it's not a haram and it's not sinful that's not my topic don't worry i'm coming to your topic but it's not it's it's a reality and we have to deal with it and that's why it's protecting the relationship and then I'm going through, inshallah, 10 to 12 different reasons of marital conflict. Why do we have problems in marriage? So marriage, sometimes young people think it's all hunky-dory, lovey-dovey, honeymoon, bedroom, holiday. You know, we'll go here and there and then we'll all be living ever happily ever after. And that's it, inshallah, we will be. But it's not what you're thinking, it's happily ever after. There, there are problems along the way. How do you deal with those problems? And what are those reasons that actually break down marriages? So we're going to go through all of those steps and then the rules of divorce and separation. Today's topic is also a very important topic. Maintaining a balanced life, which is also a topic that deals with our day-to-day -day life. It's a practical topic. Is that the title? Maintaining a, or how to live a balanced life. When we talk about how to live a balanced life, and I saw the flyer and there were some questions uh, such as, how do I take time out to look after my parents? How do I take time out to look after my children? How do I act upon deen? How do I do my studies? How do I do business? How do I study at the university and also read the Quran? Should I offer five-time prayers and shall I de dedicate myself to Islam or shall I study medicine? What shall I do? How can I balance everything? There's one simple answer, really simple answer. That one simple answer and that's it, you know, end of talk. The one simple answer, and I'm just going to elaborate on that answer. 
We know about this, but this answer sometimes or this issue does not come to our mind. Which is that whatever we are doing in this life that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us, whatever we're doing, whether we're in the masjid here offering Fajr, Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, Isha, or reciting the Quran, whether we're sitting in a lecture here or whether I am sitting here and giving a lecture, whether we are studying Ilmiya and studying Hadith and becoming scholars, reciting Quran and you know becoming Hufad of the Quran, whether we're in the marketplace selling fish or whether we are the factory making clothes or whether we are in the office, we're in the government department, whether we're in a mechanic, whether whatever we are doing, eating at home, sleeping at home, talking to your husband, talking to your wife, talking to your children, bringing up your children, looking after your old parents, traveling, vacation, everything from sleep, from the moment we wake up till the moment we sleep, this short, brief, mortal life that Allah has given us, everything we do. The simple question is, why do we do it? That's the question, why? Why do I recite the Quran? Why do I look after my parents? Why do I look after my children? Why do I smile at my husband? Why do I smile at my wife? Why do I treat my wife well, if I treat her well? Why do I treat my husband well, if I treat her well, treat him well? Why do we, why do we smile at one another? Why do we do all of this? That's the question. The answer is what Islam gives us, and the real answer why we should be doing all of this, but the issue is that why do we have these, the reason why we have all these conflicts and how can I balance between this and that and this part of life and that part of life is because what Islam tells us that why we should be doing all of these things, we don't do it for that reason. And that's the problem. The simple solution, what Islam tells us is that everything you say, you do, anything verbally uttered or anything done, any part of life, there's only one reason. It is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's it. Every action of our life, there's a only purpose, sole reason is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why every hadith book you read more or less starts with innamal a'malu bin niyat. This is the golden principle. Many ulama have said this hadith called the hadith of niyyah, the hadith of intention, Sahih al-Bukhari starts with that. And many other books of hadith. It's actually one of the four main hadiths around which the whole of Islam revolves. And from the four, the most important, if you say what is the most important hadith in Islam, it's this hadith. Many scholars have said this, classical scholars. إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ وَإِنَّمَا لِكُلِّ مَرْئِمَّا نَوَى That's the main part of the hadith. And then the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam elaborated as an example. Fa is like as an example. فَمَنْ كَانَ هِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ فَهِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَمَنْ كَانَتْ هِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى دُنْيَا يُصِيبُهَا أَوْ إِمْرَأَةٍ يَنْكِحُهَا فَهِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى مَا هَجَرَ لِهِ What does that mean? إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ Indeed, actions are by the intentions. Let me, let me explain this to you because you see the Arabic wording of the hadith. إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ If you look at it literally, Indeed, actions with intention. That's the literal meaning. Indeed, actions are with intentions. Indeed, actions are with intentions. If you look at it, apparently it, the hadith seems to indicate that an action can only transpire, can only occur, can only come into existence with an intention. And of course, we know that that's not the case. If you take the apparent meaning, it means that if someone does something, unless there's no intention, that thing won't happen. You, you punch someone, I didn't have intention, that means I haven't punched you. That's not the meaning of the hadith. If you look at it literally, that's what it means. Action only comes into existence with intention. So therefore there's a word after a'malu, which is like mahdhuf, hidden. A'malu actions are what? Maqbula, accepted by only the intentions. Actions are only accepted by intentions. Or action, there's two things, maqbula, Actions are only accepted with their intentions or number two, only rewarded by the intentions. Why we say two things, accepted or rewarded? Because niya, there's two, there's two aspects of the niya. One, and you know this, one aspect of niya is like certain actions, they require a niya for them to actually be accepted by Allah. Like we just offered Isha prayer. If you don't have the intention for Isha prayer, this is the fiqh type of niya. You know the niya in fiqh. 
For fast, you have to have an intention. With a bit of difference of opinion between different madhabs, like, but at night you should have intention. Suhoor is the intention. If you don't make an intention for fasting in Ramadan, fast is invalid. If you don't make an intention for Isha, and remember, intention is in the mind. You don't have to say it verbally. You don't have to say it. But if you want to say it, you can say it. But in the mind, you have to have an intention that you are praying Isha. If you were thinking in your mind you were praying Maghrib right now, that person's salah is invalid. So, Hajj with an intention. That's why when we say, Labbaik, Allahumma Labbaik, Labbaik, La Sharika Laka Labbaik, Talbiya, that's an intention to perform Hajj. Likewise, Zakat. If someone gives money thinking it's Hadiyah, gift, there's no Zakat, it's not valid. You have to have an intention for Zakat. So, actions are only accepted. That's one aspect of the Niyyah, which is from the fiqh point of view. But the one we want to talk about is the other aspect that actions are only rewarded by Allah if you have the intention to please him so this is this is the general principle of sharia every action now you know these actions the problem is when we look at this hadith we think actions are only salah prayer quran we all know when we pray we should be praying for who for Allah the hadith says man salla yura'i faqad ashraka billah whoever praise to show off has committed a type of shirk so we know we should be praying for Allah fasting for Allah Quran recitation for Allah any good Islamic ibadah we do we know we should be doing for Allah but we have restricted our niyyah for ibadah that we think it's ibadah this hadith is talking about all every action we do should be for the sake of Allah not just salah not just praying, not just zakat, not hajj, not just umrah. Even visiting someone at their house should be for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are going to the hospital, someone's ill. If your intention is because if I don't go, people in the community will say bad or they will think or the family will think, ah, oh, didn't come and how bad and this. There's no reward in there for this. You attend a janazah just because if you think that if you don't attend janazah, then people will say bad about you. There's no reward in that attending of the janazah. You have a marriage wedding and you invite people for walima. Why are you, why are you actually going for a walima? If it's just to fill your stomach, there's no reward. If you go to attend a sunnah, you get heaps of reward. This is the beauty of our religion. We're doing the same thing, but it's just the focus and the mind. You know, I actually once wrote, uh, tweeted this. Why, why, why do we go for walima? Why should you go for walima? You know, normally I don't have time to attend walimas. Like, and I don't get that many invitations as well, which is good because I really don't have time. But hardly... Because they're all on the weekends, and every weekend I'm out of you know, the town, like I'm here, for example. So this brother had a walima on a weekday, on a Wednesday. And he, he was a Sheikh Mawlana, a good friend of mine. Um, his daughter was getting married last year. So he, a week before, he phoned, and then he messaged. It was a Wednesday evening. He said, please come, inshallah. And, and he was really asking, and a lot of other people as well, uh, alongside me, so, you know, I, I took time out and, and, you know, the intention in my mind was, one of the intentions is to idkhalu surur fi qalbi muslim. To bring happiness into the heart of a believer, just to make them happy for the sake of Allah is a great act of reward. You know, it becomes an ibadah, a great ibadah. So I made that intention and it's also sunnah to go to someone's walima. So then I tweeted this. Before I was going, because most of the tweets for my, it's my own self. It's like what I'm thinking, a reminder for me, then I just say it. So I, I tweeted, I said, when you attend a walima, what, why, should, why do we attend a walima, someone's wedding? Don't attend a walima just to eat food. Attend walima to fulfill the sunnah. There's so much reward. Think to yourself, this is a sunnah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He actually emphasized, I will get reward and I want to bring happiness into the heart of a Muslim brother or sister. I was at the walima and I met a brother. He said, Salaam alaikum. Salaam alaikum salam. He said, you know what? I read your tweet two hours ago. And I forwarded it to all my friends because we were all debating because we wanted to go and play football. Oh, so sorry, soccer. Soccer, yeah. We want to go to play soccer. So on this Wednesday, we had an intern, like five-a-side soccer match. But our friend, you know, like that sheikh is their friend as well. And he's invited all of us for walima. So we were all WhatsApping each other. 
that do you know what the menu is? Do you know what the menu is? Like if, the, if it's a good menu, we'll sacrifice football and go for the f walima. And if you think the menu is not that great, then we might as well go and play soccer. So he said, I looked at this tweet and I shared it to everybody that are we going for the menu or are we going for reward? And because of that, they changed their mind and they all came to the walima. Whatever the food is. It's not about the food. I mean, are we all hungry and like we never get food? Is that why we go to eat? You know, Walima? That's not the. So, how can we complain? If we make every aspect of our life to please Allah, there will be no complaint about anything. Someone did, you know, even to. Like I said, these actions are not just prayer, salah, everything. Even when you attend, enter your own house. There was a sheikh called Dr. Abdullahiya Arifi Rahimahullah, who was a sheikh of one of my teachers, Mufti Taqi Uthmani Hafizahullah. He says that, you know, this comes through training. It's not easy. You have to train. Acting upon niyyah. He says that, you know, for about a year I trained myself that when I used to come back from work, before I enter my house, when normally when parents, when you go back home, after a day's work, if you have small children, what do you want to do? You want to go inside and first thing, go inside your house. You've got small, small children. So young parents will understand this better. And we have a lot of young children here. What do you want to do? You want to go to them, pick them up, kiss them, hug them. Yeah, more than your wife or husband as well. You know. In the beginning, it's the hugging, kissing with the wife, husband. And when you have children, then the children come before. Normal, no problem. It's still, you know, some, some parents, it's like, it's quite crazy. It's, some men have this problem, not women. I know it's not a marriage talk, but this is, a, some men have this problem that she gives more attention to my children than myself. Are they your children or someone else's children? Come on. Giving attention to your children is giving attention to you. This is complete being immature. I've had some, you know, people... Oh, my wife doesn't give me any attention. So she's giving, she's looking after your own son. Are you crazy? I just don't get that. It's, uh, subhanAllah, I don't know where the brain goes sometimes. So when you have children, this, this, is, this is something that brings the spouses closer. You know, before you have children, that's not the only way. There's other ways as well. As well you know, so it doesn't mean that if you don't have children, you can't be close. But it's one of the ways of getting close. So when you enter your house, you haven't seen your children all day. What do you want to do? You want to go inside your house. You want to kiss them and embrace them and hug your children. Sheikh Dr. Abdullahi Arif Rahimullah used to say that when I used to come to my house, I used to stand outside my door. Before I take my keys out and open the door, make a two minute intention. Oh Allah, giving children love is a sunnah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When he would see his grandchildren, Hassan and Hussein, radiallahu anhumah, may Allah be pleased with them. He used to embrace them, he used to kiss them on the forehead, he used to uh, put his hands on them, hug them, he used to, you know, the, you know what he, how he would treat Hassan and Hussein. He used to lie down and make them sit on, you know, stand on his feet and then say, irqa, irtaqi, irtaqi, you know, climb up, climb up, and then they would stand on his chest and he would give them a lot of love. This is a sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He himself said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, give affection to children. So in accordance with that sunnah, I want to go inside and give love to my children. Two minutes outside the house, making this intention. Then open the door, then go inside and then kiss his children. That whole kissing children and embracing your children and showing compassion has become an act of ibadat that takes you to Jannah. Before that intention, it was a worldly act. Every act, eating food, why do we eat food? This comes with training, brothers and sisters. We have to start training ourselves. It might take a year, it might take a two, then it becomes natural part of your life. Then you don't need those two minutes. Afterwards, first you might need two minutes. Then those two minutes become one minute, 50, 30 seconds. Then it becomes one minute. Then it becomes 30 seconds. Then 20 seconds. Then 10 seconds. Then five seconds. Then like a second. You just need a second. And then you, it's just becomes part and parcel of your life. You will be doing things, but in your mind and heart, you're focused on the correct intention. Every aspect, this is the beauty of our deen, that there's nothing in our life which is not deen. There's no separation. There's nothing. Driving a car is deen, if we make it deen. Traveling on a train, on a plane, deen. Eating chicken, halal chicken. 
pizza, kebab, burgers, act of ibadah. Before eating, what shall we say? We should, what shall we intend? Oh Allah, this is a great ni'mah, this is a great gift that you have given me. You have said, look after your body, look after yourself. With this, I'll get strength, I'll get power, I'll get energy, I'll be able to do work, I'll be able to serve the community, I'll be able to worship you. This, this food that you ate, fasting is an ibadah, eating is an ibadah. Offering salah, tahajjud is an ibadah, sleeping is an ibadah. It's not only tahajjud, you sleep with the right intention, according to the sunnah way, read your dua, make a nice intention in your mind, good intention, all night, seven hours, sleeping, snoring away, every snore is an act of reward. No problem, don't worry. Sleeping is ibadah. This is why there is nothing in our religion that is not part of deen. You know, I remember two, last year or the year before, <clears throat> I, I visited New York. Uh, and the similar, I had a talk at the university and the students, this is what they wanted to know as well. How can we balance between deen and dunya? So they made a big flyer poster, balancing between deen and dunya. I saw that poster and I let them have that poster. But when I started, this was at St. John's University, if anyone knows from New York. St. John's, I think. This was two years ago. Balance between deen and dunya. All the students want to know, we're studying, we're becoming medics, we're studying, studying, like how can we balance? We feel so bad, we spend like 10 hours of our day studying, going to dunya, 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 where's our time for the deen? So you know what I said? I said this, I went and I started the talk and I said this flyer, this title is wrong. Because you're thinking balance between deen, salah and Quran and dunya, university, who said university is dunya? Everything for a believer is deen. So I said, don't write balance between deen and dunya. Write balance between one aspect of deen and another aspect of deen. Balance between one aspect of deen and another aspect of deen. Being a medic, being a medic is also deen. But with the right intention. If you're studying and you're studying medicine, anyone studying medicine here? Anyone a doctor here? Yes. Every day you are serving the community. It's an act of ibadah, a great act of ibadah. But the intention has to be correct. And this is the thing that, you know, our intention, even what we do studies for, universe, for students who want to go to university, the world has become very materialistic. We all sadly make our decisions based mainly on dollars, money. Classically, that wasn't the case. Money is secondary. No problem making that as one of the intentions but the main intention in classical times people never used to go into medicine because they think that's going to give them a lot of money or become a, you know go into dentistry because that's going to give them a lot of money or go into law because that's going to give them a lot of money they would go into something where they would feel that they can serve humanity and the community more what's their passion how can i help how can i serve the world and the human beings how can i look after people if that's the intention then that study becomes an act of ibadah. So going back to this question and then trying to wrap this up in a way that I want to explain. The answer should be that everything we should be doing for the sake of Allah, for the pleasure of Allah, which means, which means even our relationships, I said visiting someone, janaza prayer, visiting the ill, visiting the sick, when we give a gift to someone, hadiya, why do we give that gift? The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, tahadu, tahabu, exchange gifts, you will increase in love. When you give a gift, the main intention of giving that gift should be to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Secondarily, to please that person. But the reason I want to please this person is because I want to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you invite someone for weddings, why do we invite them? We should be inviting them for the sake of Allah. So every act that we do, every act, hadiyah, gifts. So this innam al niyad is not restricted to salah, it's not restricted to fasting, it's not restricted to just what we think is ibadah. It covers every aspect of our life. So now we want to balance our life. We feel that sometimes 
we're not doing something or we're not doing something positive but we should realize that whatever we're doing if we're doing it for the sake of Allah then that in itself is an act of ibadah some brothers they come and they say you know I can't spend I spent too much time you know since I got married you know and some religious people make them feel bad ah, since you marry you know come in the masjid and not volunteering he's, he's doing ibadah in the bedroom with his wife sitting and talking this is also ibadah who said that's not ibadah great act of ibadah that reminds me of a famous hadith there's abdullah ibn amr ibn al-as radiyallahu anhu this hadith is in musnad ahmad and bukhari and different places different parts there was a sahabi called abdullah ibn amr ibn al-as his father was amr ibn al-as radiyallahu anhu great companion the son of the great companion radiyallahu anhuma a very uh, prestigious family his mother was Ummu Abdullah so his father married him off to a woman from Quraysh Dhatu Hasab of high lineage and a very respectable family so he got married after he got married his father used to and this is good you know his father used to check up on how he's treating his wife not check up on how his wife is treating him his wife is to check up on what? How is he treating his wife? Not how his wife are you looking after my son. Likewise, not just one way, likewise the other. You know, the parents of the woman not keep on checking, oh, is your husband treating you well? And my, my daughter, is she being looked after? No, no. Are you looking after your husband? This is how the approach should be. So his father used to ask his daughter-in-law, how, how is Abdullah? Is everything okay? Is everything okay? So once he asked, how is Abdullah, his son, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, since is everything okay in your marriage? So she said, Ni'mal, ni'mal rajul, ni'mal rajul, or min khayri rijal in another narration. He's a very good man, a very nice man, very nice man. He's a very, very pious man. So pious that he is so pious. He is so devoted to Allah. Lam yufattish lana kanafan. He's never revealed the cloth. Uh, he's never moved the curtain from us. Walam yata lana farashan, and he never comes to our bed. In other words, she was complaining, but even complaining in a good way. This is how they would complain in the olden times. Not like oh, look at him. She praised him for his piety but in an indirect way put the complaint as well that he is so amazing he's, he's a very pious very very pious man so devoted to Allah so devoted that whole night he just worships Allah he doesn't have time to come to the bed to sleep he doesn't have time but it's so amazing that he doesn't have time for me just imagine he has so much time for Allah so she's saying that he she has he's all night worshipping so much that he doesn't have time for me but just how amazing he is that's that's how the female companions were as well the, there's a way to complain as well so his father understood so then he called him and said so what what's happening he says oh you know look at me i'm so sinful and i need to um really I'm worried about the akhirah. I don't have time. I want to worship Allah all night. And you know, some of the companions, not just him, but some of the Sahaba, or many Sahaba, were overcome by this. Ghalabatul hal. Why were they overcome by this? Because they used to sit in the gathering of the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam. When they would sit in the gathering of the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the the fear of the hereafter, akhirah, the 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 worry and concern about the next life would completely overcome them ghalaba like overcome them and they would be immersed like they just wanted to fast every day and just pray and just not sleep and not eat and just like become like monks that's how they wanted to be this is why a group came to the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam's house a rahat came and asked about the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam you know that's why they used to come many of them would keep on coming to rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam's wives to ask what does he do at home what does he do at home because they were thinking that you know what when he as soon as he enters his house he's on the musalla allahu akbar until the next minute he comes out he doesn't have time for anything he must be worshiping allah all night like 24 7 and just 
fasting every day. So they would come and ask. And when the wives used to say that, you know what? He jokes around with us. One day he was telling stories all night long. 11 women and the stories. He tells us stories. Bassam and Bahakan, he's joking. He's playing with the kids. He's having a chill, like we say. He's relaxing. You know, فَإِذَا سَمِعَ الْأَذَانِ خَرَجِ إِلَى الصَّلَاةِ But when he hears the adhan, he goes for salah. That's it. But he, he also helps in the household chores. He's doing things. So they used to scratch their head. And they used to think, no. Then they used to say, because remember, when you are in غَلَبَةُ hal, you have an excuse. You don't understand. When, you're, when you've gone crazy a bit, I know that word is not right for the Sahaba, but I mean like when, you, when you've gone one way, this is what happens to some young people. When you're just in one mission, then you just don't, anyone tries to put some sense in your head, you don't get it. So then excuses come. Oh, but yeah, but that was Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah has forgiven all his sins previous and when not Rasulullah. We have to pray all night. We can't do what he does. That's for him. So one of them left and said, yeah, I'm not going to ever eat. I'm going to fast every single day. One of them said, I'll never marry women. And the third one said, I'm never going to sleep at night. When the Messenger وسلم, came, he was told about these companions that they said this. He said, فَمَا بَالُوا أَقْوَامُ What's wrong with these people? Call them. And then he called them and he said, Look, I am Rasulullah. I am the most fear of Allah. But I sleep and I fast. I, I sleep and I pray. I fast and I don't fast. And I, women, I marry women. And then he said, فَمَنْ رَغِبَ عَنْ سُنَّةِ فَلَيْسَ مِنِّي Whoever turns away from my sunnah is from, not from me. So this was just a side hadith. But the main hadith, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn Aas radiallahu anhu, his wife, when he complained, so the father-in-law called him. Says, what do you do? Says, all night I pray. Uh, pray. In, in one day, I make a khatam of the Qur'an. I fast every single day. So he took him to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa In some narrations, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa said, he went to complain to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, take me to him, I'll come to your house. Not call him here. I'll come to your house. And he came to his house and he made him sit. He goes, Ya Abdullah, oh Abdullah, come on. What's going on? Young Abdullah, young, newly married. So what do you do? Say, Ya Rasulullah, I want to, I love Allah and I worry about Akhirah. I do one khatam every single day. One Quran in one day. He said, no, no, no. You don't do one khatam in a day. Complete one Quran in one month. That's what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said to him. Complete one Quran in one month. What about fasting? I fast every day. No. Fast three days. I fast three days, he said. Three days a month. Ayyamul Weed. Because one fast gives you how many rewards? Ten. So three fasts, reward for 30 days, one month reward anyway. Only three fasts. He said, Ya Rasulullah, inni utiqu akthara min dhalik. I have power to do more, more. No, no, I want to do more. He's now he's arguing with the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam in a respectful way, of course, because he thinks that he thinks that I'm very uh, weak and I can't do it. No, Ya Rasulullah, I'm quite. Look at me, I, I can do it. Please, a bit more, a bit more. He said, okay, one completion of the Quran in twenty days. He said, no, Ya Rasulullah, I can do more. He said, ten days. He said, no, I can do more. He said, okay, three days. He said, no, I can do more. He said, no, 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 no more. That's it. You can't, I'm not going to give you more permission than this. You cannot do completion of the Quran in less than three days. Three days, three nights, that's a must for you. Promise. So he made him promise that. Fasting, he kept on saying, I can do more, I can do fast every day. First he said fast three days and he said, okay, every week, uh, three in a week. Then he said, fast two days and don't fast one day. He said, no, no, I want to do more. Then he said, fast one day, Sawmu Dawood. Fast one day, don't fast. He said, I can do more, I want to fast every day. He said, no, no. La sawma fawqa sawma Dawood. There is no fast better than the fasting of Dawood So then he stopped at that. But you know Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As radiallahu anhu, when he was old, when he couldn't do that, he was regretting. He said, I wish I had taken the early concession of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa I can't do it anymore. But I promised him, it's not haram, but he says, because I said this to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa I agreed with him, I have to do this. But anyway, when the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa told him, told him all of this, then he said to him this, إِنَّ لِنَفْسِكَ عَلَيْكَ حَقْ وَإِنَّ لِزَوْجِكَ عَلَيْكَ حَقْ وَإِنَّ لِعَيْنِكَ عَلَيْكَ حَقْ وَإِنَّ لِزَوْرِكَ عَلَيْكَ حَقْ وَإِنَّ لِضَيْفِكَ عَلَيْكَ حَقْ Indeed, your body has a right over you. Indeed, your eye has a right over you. Sleep. Indeed, your body has a right over you. Indeed, your spouse, your wife has a right over you. 
Indeed, your visitor has a right over you. Li baifika, li zawrika, the one who's ziyara, the one who's visiting you. Fa'ati kulla di haqqin haqqah. Therefore, give each rightful thing their right. Give each rightful thing their right. This is the balance that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is teaching this Sahabi companion. So he told him that, look, your body has a right over you. You go to the gym, make an ibrah in the gym. And I was just thinking today, you know, I, I want to start some gym, actually. I don't know, this thought come, came in Toronto, why? I don't know, Allahu A'lam. But I was just thinking today that when I go back, sorry? Toronto is healthy. Toronto's healthy, yeah, I think so. But I was just thinking today that, inshallah, I'm going to join the gym when I go back to the UK. Monday, Tuesday, I'll have to look into it. Just, you need, you need to you know, do some gym stuff. Inshallah ta'ala. With this intention, every day you go into the gym. Imagine, just like you're going to the masjid, you're going to the gym, it's ibadah. Why separate masjid from gym? It becomes an act of reward, brothers and sisters. It, because you're, you're saying, you're making intention that my messenger, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, said, my religion says to me that indeed your body has a right over you. Living a healthy lifestyle, eating healthy food, exercising is an act of ibadah with that intention. So if you want to balance your life, don't feel bad that, oh, you know what, I'm not spending time. You see, this is the principle of deen, and this is a really important principle, very important. Deen is not what we think is deen. Deen is not what feels like it's deen. This is a really important principle. Listen to this carefully. I want to just elaborate on this and we'll end. Deen, Islam, is not what gives you a buzz or what gives you a feeling that it's deen. Look, certain things gives you, they give you a buzz. You feel. Like for example, our sisters here, when they're in the menstrual period, can they pray? They can't pray. Do they have to pray? They don't have to pray. Do they have to fast? No. Can they fast? No. You know when they're in the menstrual period, hey, now somebody will say, well, look, you know, I feel like praying. Why am I like being deprived of praying? It's not what you feel like doing. Because prayer in itself is not the objective. Salah is not the objective. Fasting is not the objective. Zakat is not the objective. Hajj, Allah just used certain things. The real objective of our deen is submission, ubudiyah, slavehood. What Allah wants from us is are we ready to go against ourselves and do what he wants us to do? Like if he says turn right, like are we robots before Allah or not? If Allah said five times a day, just you know, paint the walls, then paint the walls would be ibadah. But Allah chose this prayer. Allah could have chosen anything. Allah could have said go five times a day and just lift, lift, you know, do weight lifting. That's your five time prayers. That could have been. Imagine go hajj, does it make sense? Some of the things don't make sense at all in hajj, logically. Do you need, or well maybe some people need a bit of exercise on Safa Marwa, you know, but do you need to really run? Like, why are you running for? Do you need to lose some weight? Maybe you do, but some people don't need to lose weight. So why do they have to run? Why do they have to go around around the Kaaba like seven times? Like, why do you have to spend $5,000 and $7,000, how many dollars, going all the way there to pick up stones and hit a wall? Like, what does that wall need your stones to come from Canada? Logically, there's no sense. That's no shaitan. You know, people think that shaitan, you know, if you see some clips, this old man taking slippers and, you know, let's hit the shaitan. That's not shaitan. <laughs> you know, before they used to have like a pillar. So people literally thought that shaitan lived in that pillar or something. So all of hajj logically doesn't make sense. But what Allah wants from us is submission. Because Allah said it, whether it makes sense or not, if Allah said just, you know, paint that wall, because Allah said it. Allah wants from us ubudiyah, slavehood. Salah itself is not the maqsad, it's not the objective. That's not the objective. Fasting itself is not the objective. So the principle that I'm, I was explaining is that deen is not what we feel is deen, what gives us spirituality. It's what Allah has said. If what Allah wants from us, look, 
Somebody might think, you know what? On Eid day, I want to fast, I want to fast. But Eid al-Fitr day, I want to fast like, come on, I can't. I, I feel a buzz for the sake of Allah. On Eid day, I want to fast. Eid day fasting is haram. The same fast, if you don't fast in Ramadan, you are sinful. And if you fast in Ramadan, on Eid day, then it's haram to fast. Why? Because fasting is not the objective. The same thing becomes haram. Fajr time, Dhuhr, Asr, five time prayers. If you don't pray, what, do you, what happens? Sinful, right? Someone says, I want to pray sunrise. I want to pray sunrise time. We all know sunrise time is haram to pray. Is it haram? You know that, yes? But you get a buzz, I want to pray. I'm praying, what am I doing? I'm not doing anything bad. The same salah, sajda, becomes haram. I'm doing sajda, sujood, prostration at sunrise for Allah. Haram to do sajda. To pray salah and do sajda. Why? Because Allah said no. It's not the sajda that's the objective, it's what Allah has said. If Allah says sajda, then to do sajda is farm. If Allah says no sajda, no sajda then. You know why? This is why I'll tell you another thing. Do you know in suhoor and iftar, we all know that in iftar, we should haste. You know that, right? It's makru to delay the fast. Do you know that? I know everyone knows that because we all want to eat early anyways. Like, you know, with that thing we definitely know. And you know suhoor? What's the ruling about suhoor? The more delay you do in suhoor, there's more, more reward. Do you know what the reason behind that is? The reason is that we are becoming robots before Allah. Allah says, you can eat, you can eat. So eating, 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 Allah eating, eating. What time does suhoor end around here? Around, what was it last? 4.30. So four, imagine 4.30 is the time. So 4.25, eating, Allah eating, eating. 4.29, eating. 4.30, stop. Stop. Last minute. Eat as until the last minute because you're stopping when Allah says stop. When Allah says if Maghrib time, Allahu Akbar, eat. Straight away, I'm eating. Oh Allah, you said I'm eating. This is why the hikmah to delay the suhoor, that you stop when Allah tells you to stop and you eat straight away when Allah tells you to eat. That's the maqsad. Now somebody might say, oh Allah, you know, I stayed hungry for you 19 hours. I'm going to give you one more hour till Isha today. Your whole fast becomes makruh. There's no reward. Imagine, we prayed Isha right now. Imagine, yeah, we were praying Isha behind Maulana Shakir. Yeah, we really enjoyed praying Isha. After four rak'ah, somebody just said, you know what? It's so amazing. I'm feeling an amazing buzz. Oh Allah, I'm giving you one more rak'ah, five rak'ah Isha today. Your Isha is gone. Allah said, I told you four. It's not about what you feel like it's deen. Deen is not what is fun. Not what you feel spirituality in. So women on menstruation, they want to worship Allah. But Allah said, don't, you don't, you can't worship. You can't worship. You can't go for hajj. That's it. What Allah has said is become, that's ibadah. So to, when we're balancing our life, we want to do different things. We should always remember the main intention is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then after that, whatever we do, we should realize and think that is this something that pleases Allah? If it pleases Allah, then don't feel bad about it. And in terms of time, you know, a lot of the, one of the main problems that people can't give time for other things is because what we have today, the smartphone. How much time do we waste online, on WhatsApp, on social media? And then people complain that I don't have time for this, and I don't have time for that. Because so much time is wasted on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and WhatsApp. That's where all the time goes. If we take that much time out, you know, sometimes you realize that. I'm myself included. You know, when I was traveling in the plane right now, um, some people even have online internet access even whilst you're traveling, but I don't. So you can see like seven hours, I was able to do so much in those seven hours because I had no online access. When I was traveling from London to Toronto yesterday, I read two, three books. There's no distraction. Three, more than three. There was about four or five, about four books I read, small, small books in those seven hours. Because there's no WhatsApp and there's nothing. There's no, nothing. I don't have to check. No, completely away from the online world. So much time we have. So we can balance our time. Balancing between giving time to parents, 
giving time to children, that's also ibadah. Think that I'm doing ibadah. This is ibadah. Allah has told me I'll get reward. Time to study outside, that's ibadah. Every aspect of your life becomes ibadah. And you don't feel bad about doing one thing and not doing something else. As long as you fulfill the faraid and you avoid the haram, that's the main thing. That doesn't mean say, okay, I'm going to look after my parents and not pray Fajr, Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib. That's, of course, that's haram. Fulfilling the faraid and then every aspect of life, anything we do, becomes an act of Islam and Deen, inshallah. I think I'll just end with that. I don't know how long I went. But, um, but inshallah, may Allah grant us. Uh, there was one or two other things I wanted to say, but I think we'll just leave it to that.